Hello and welcome to tonight's webcast, Diet and Cancer, How to Reduce Risk and Diet for Existing Cancer with Laura Laval. Laura Laval is a registered dietitian and nutritionist who has years of experience in hospital-based dietetics as well as extensive experience in integrative medicine settings, including in clinic. She's extremely knowledgeable in all things dietetics, and I know you'll enjoy her presentation today. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please raise your hand or use the chat box if you have a question. I am Libby Bricker, your moderator, and I am recording tonight's session. So we will post the recording on our blog at metaboliccode.com within 24 to 48 hours. Also on metaboliccode.com, which you can see on your screen, we're on the Join Now page. You can register for a demo of the Metabolic Code system if you're not already a subscriber. This is the page where you would start your free trial, and then the demos are under Platforms. So let me pull up Laura's presentation and hand it over to her in just a moment. Okay, it's all yours. Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone. Um, we dedicated this one to a discussion of diet and cancer. Um, what can we do with our diet to help prevent cancer? And um, what can we do if somebody has already gotten cancer and um, they're undergoing treatment and we want to support um, better results through diet? Uh, so those are our two um, ways we're going to look at it tonight, although I will say I focused much more on the cancer, a diet for cancer prevention because that's by far where I feel we can be most effective with diet. Once a person has cancer, we have a lot more challenges and I'll just discuss that briefly toward the end. And um, with that, we'll, we'll move forward and uh, start our discussion. You know, there are varying statistics on cancer. I think everybody that's on the line and everybody you talk to somewhere in their life, they've been affected by cancer. And that's because we do have astronomical rates of cancer going on throughout the world, and especially actually in the United States, the rates are very high. There are a million uh, new diagnoses of cancer every year. So, um, and that adds up to about 40% of people uh, will be diagnosed with some kind of cancer in their lifetime. So. The numbers are really high and, you know, cancer, even though um, more and more cancers are becoming more treatable uh, and they're having a little more success with cancer treatment, there are still so many cancers that are very resistant to treatment um, and that they don't have high success rates with. So this is a disease that scares people because treatments aren't certain at all. Uh, although there are many exciting new um, things that are going on with cancer treatment. I'm actually ex more excited about cancer treatment, the direction that they're going and what they're finding out in research than, I, than I've ever been. But uh, still, the other thing about cancer is that, of course, it you know causes people to go through a lot of pain sometimes, causes them to really waste away and suffer. And that's another one of the reasons why people um, are pretty frightened of cancer. But uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about factor. When you look up information on, you know, cancer risk factors, you'll see all the typical things that, you know, that we see. We shouldn't smoke or use smokeless tobacco products. Um, it definitely is a risk factor. But what if you don't smoke? Well, um, alcohol is something that increases cancer risks. And I think this is something that um, a lot of people ignore. You know, we're used to our glass or two of wine each day or a cocktail in the evening. But really, alcohol is not to be taken lightly. And so um, I'll just mention here that keeping alcohol down to the no more than one to two drinks per day 
uh, for women and no more than two, two to three or four, depending on whose statistics you look at, but two to three for men, uh, it's a big deal and uh, it's not to be taken lightly. One of the ways that um, you know alcohol can increase risks is that it's just an actual irritant. So as you drink and swallow alcohol in your mouth and your esophagus, the chemicals and components in alcohol can cause damage as you swallow um, your drink. Uh, another way alcohol contributes to risks uh, is that it raises estrogen levels. And when we break alcohol down in the body, when we metabolize it, we have a, an intermediate substance that gets formed called, called acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde directly increases cancer risk. It's a chemical that increases risk. And then the other way is that alcohol can slow down repair to DNA. So um, I just wanted to make sure I really emphasize this because um, it, it's significant. The other big cancer risk factor that you will see, oh, we can go back. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to just talk about obesity because um, my little soapbox here is that there are discussions today going on because you know we're ten, we seem like we're losing this battle on overweight and rates of obesity going up uh, tremendously high with some states approaching 38% of their population as obese. Um, and we seem to be um, sort of thwarted with obese, you know, weight loss at every turn. For I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When we um, reduce calories too much, it increases hunger hormones. When we exercise more, it increases hunger hormones. Uh, when we don't get sleep, when we do lose weight, it releases uh, toxins back into the bloodstream and can. Uh, cause weight loss plateaus. And so what's going on is there's all kinds of discussion about maybe we should just give up trying to think about necessarily losing weight, but we should just become healthier eaters and try to become the healthiest we can at whatever weight we are. Well, when it comes to cancer, uh, we definitely know that having too much fat on our body increases uh, cancer risk dramatically. So um, it, when it comes to cancer risk, you're going to have higher risk if you're overweight or obese. So we want to try to do everything we can to support um, weight loss. And as those of uh, you know that have tuned into our webinars before, we, we teach a total metabolic approach to that. And we find it to be much more successful. So um, we, I feel that we can do more and we should do more than, and not just give up the fight basically in this war against um, our rates of overweight and obese population. We need to do everything we can. So um, in the big scheme of things, um, the estimates are that about 20% of all cancers um, can be tied back to excess body weight. That's current um, estimates. I think that's probably going to be shown over time to be kind of low, but that's where they put it now. Okay, and so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. So, um, okay, give me just one moment. I got a message that we may have degraded sound quality, and I need to close any other applications. So I think I still have my email open. I just want to make sure that I close that. Okay. We're having storms in the area, so that may be a factor. If anyone does notice degraded sound quality, please let me know in the chat box. And let me just expand your slides, Laura, and we can continue. Okay, and if it doesn't resolve, uh, I guess we can always reschedule. Okay, it should. We probably need to. Okay, this should help, so let's see. Okay. Okay, and the next slide. So just to, in order to sort of tell a little bit more about how what we do with diet affects our um, cancer prevention or not, it, I wanted to kind of go through how 
forms again and kind of do a little review of that. Um, cancer is, what is it, first of all? It's an unregulated proliferation of aberrant cells that um, can form in organs and tissues. And the, they become aberrant due to a loss of normal controls. And so that's when we can um, have unregulated growth. The cells don't differentiate like normal cells. And as that continues to grow, we, get, we can get tissue invasion into other tissue and um, tumors, of course, can metastasize. So in order to have cancer develop, though, and get to the point of unregulated proliferation, we have to have uh, damage, an initial damage to DNA of a cell. And that is called initiation. Uh, then uh, we are learning that it's not just one simple little damage to DNA. Usually it's cells that are damaged multiply. And then we have things happen where um, tumor suppressor cells are inhibited by certain things or there are all kinds of factors that can um, cause this damaged DNA um, cell to continue to grow. And that's called promotion. So this is where cells are surviving and they're not being controlled, they, like I say, by suppressor cells and natural killer cells and things like that. So they continue to grow. And then progression is where the process has gone on quite a long time and we have substantial growth and then maybe even metastasis. So uh, what are cancer initiators? And I'd like to, um, you to pay attention to this because if you're a practitioner out there, I know you're, you're very well aware of this, but um, just mark it in the back of your mind that consumers do not understand. I think that for, for consumers that a lot of consumers that I come into contact with, the average lay person, they don't realize. They think cancer is almost all caused by foods and diet. They don't stop to think about and people are more and more aware of car you know carcinogens in our environment uh, and in personal products and things like that. Heavy metals, they're more and more aware of toxicity issues, but they kind of forget about smoke and even secondhand smoke. Uh, they forget uh, about, you know, x-rays and radiation. I think sometimes there could be radon gas. And people are largely very unaware that things like viruses can trigger cell initiation um, and can trigger cancers. So, um, and we know UV light, sunlight, but um, you know, there's debate about that, whether too much, too little. Um, you know, there are people out there that advocate that when you don't get any sun, your cancer risks are even higher due to lack of um, vitamin D possibly. So that one um, people are aware of, but it's just so controversial. So anyway, but my point here is that people don't stop to think about all the other things in our environment that can cause cancer sometimes, I think. Things like viruses, radiation, things like that. Uh, and they don't realize how much um, endogenous production of reactive oxygen species is an issue. So um, controlling our um, all sources of internal inflammation. And um, I think a lot of people may know the term epigenetics now. So we know that um, our methylating vitamins are um, stick on to, they, they describe this as little flags coming off of cells, and they are epigenetics cause cancer, um, cause cells to either express or to not express. So one of the things that I think is very good news about cancer is that it's not genetically driven and our epigenetics um, can help manage it. So things that in the diet and nutrition wise that turn, um, allow can cells to express or to not express. So that's the epigenetics. You know, people don't quite understand it yet. So um, my point with, with when I talk to lay people is, is that there's a lot more involved in cancer than, than people really think. 
Uh, one of the good news is that I think people are very aware that free radicals are um, involved in cancer. You can have so many free radicals that they can be a, uh, something that cause the initial damage to a cell, and they're definitely involved in the promotion of cancer, reactive oxygen species, so free, uh, free radicals, and anything that causes them like xenobiotics in the environment and heavy metals. Um, there are substances called four ball esters that are in the environment that are um, cause uh, the lack of activity from our tumor suppressor cells. Um, other chemicals in the environment uh, like dioxin, which is not supposed to be getting used anymore, but still ubiquitous in the environment from days when it was used. And then there are certain things like uh, what they call per peroxisome proliferators, and these come from oxidized fats. So that is one of the reasons why in our Metabolic Code diet materials we dedicated a whole page to um, different fats that we can use on our foods, which ones tolerate heat, which ones don't. This is um, something that's not, not to be taken lightly. It's a, it's a real big deal. So making sure that we're using fats at the proper temperatures um, because oxidized fats are definitely known as cancer promoter. So it's something to make people aware of. And then, of course, we have to be aware of um, endocrine disruptors and, um, you know, our estradiol can promote um, cancer that's endogenous or uh, substances from the environment that, that cause endocrine dis disruption of estrogen like DES. So um, that's a very strong estrogen activity substance that is in the environment yet, even though they haven't used it for years. So these are different types of cancer promoters. And then um, getting back to our risk factors then. So cancer progression, um, I didn't put a slide in because that's just as things continue to uh, progress with lack of tumor suppression and more and more inflammation, all of those factors are the same things that, that um, cause cancer progression. So now, getting back to cancer risk factors and diet itself. Is diet in and of itself a big risk factor? I would say that if you ask it cancer researchers, um, they would tend to say overall no. There are certain things that are, we know that increase risk. But diet is actually typically just lumped in with physical activity as part of something that we keep ourselves overall healthy to help lower our risk, and it's lumped into that 20% of overweight and obese. They can't really come down to it and say, if you eat this way, you're going to have increased risk for cancer. There's really only one um, food category that they do that with, and you'll see the slides coming up, and you can probably guess what it is. But anyway, um, you know, People, you know, diet is, and your lifestyle is one of the few things that you can do to control your risk. So, um, you know, let's let people know what they can do. You know, diet can, since we know that inflammation uh, plays a huge role in cancer initiation and cancer promotion, we know that diet can help us be, uh, fight inflammation or it can be pro-inflammatory. And not only that, since our weight is such a big issue, we know we have to know what to do with diet to help um, help us manage our weight. So when it comes down to diet as a risk, um, something that helps prevent cancer, we know uh, certain things that are going to have, um, certainly going to have some impact. So we want to limit intake of foods that increase risk, and we want to increase intake of foods that have anti-inflammatory action that lower risk. So the number one thing with diet is to understand how to control the role of inflammation and immune related inflammation. If you remember on my one slide a, a couple of slides ago, 
a known promoter of cancer is macrophage and neutrophil related reactive oxygen species. So we want to control um, overactivity of the immune system and the inflammation that comes with it. So um, that's why I wanted to make sure I noted in here that one of the important things we, can, we need to do is control inflammation from overactive Th2 immunity. So we want to keep our immune system strong and balanced. One of the things we know, for example, when we have overactive Th2 immunity, that's uh, part of our physiological process in the body that underlies autoimmune diseases. So that is what is going on in autoimmunity. And we know that people who have autoimmune diseases have increased risk for cancer. So we know that this overactivation of Th2 plays a role. So that's one area we, we should be focusing on when it comes to diet. Um, another area is um, controlling insulin and um, insulin regulation in the body and controlling uh, diabetes. One of the huge factors that causes inflammation in the body is elevated blood glucose. And they know that studies show that when hemoglobin A1Cs elevate um, risk for and diabetes, risk for cancer increases. And then when di people with diabetes end up having to use insulin, the use of um, and having more insulin in the body itself dramatically increases risk for cancer. And that's because these are all processes that are super pro-inflammatory. So anything that's going to improve insulin and glucose regulation is going to reduce risk. And I think this is something that the average consumer still does not know. They do not know. Um, nothing uh, pet peeve. I, I saw a cancer drive to raise money for breast cancer research. And the, the way they were going to raise money was have everybody go to an ice cream shop, a popular one in, uh, back in Cincinnati, and buy ice cream. And some of the proceeds would go to cancer, breast cancer research. And I thought, oh. If that isn't <laughs> the worst possible irony there could be. So you're going and eating something that raises your risk of cancer, and, um, and people aren't even aware. So uh, if I could change one thing about cancer awareness, that would be the thing that I would change, is to make people much more aware of the fact that if you want to control your cancer risk, one of the most important things you can do to do that is to control your blood sugar. So this is my slide that I've used. Um, you'll have to click quickly, Libby, to get all the <laughs> things to come up. But this is the one that shows what happens in, um, with Th1, the balance between Th1 helper cells and Th2. So Basically what happens if somebody has autoimmune processes going, it means they have an elevation in the activity, they have overactivity of the Th2 side of, help, of your T helper cells. So the Th1 side gets suppressed. And these are, this is the side that um, fights, that pr has production of natural killer cells that destroy virally infected cells. And remember what I said about Viral, viruses being something that can initiate cancer, um, and natural killer cells actually destroy cancer cells themselves. So when you have an upregulation of Th2, such as happens when people have allergies, uh, and when people have autoimmunity, your, you know, the body only has so many T helper cells it can produce. So if the T helper cells are going to make mostly Th2 cells, that means we're not going to have enough of the Th1. And you, if you've tuned in on some of my other webinars, you've seen that um, one of the things I point out here is the production of the IL-4, IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha. These are pro-inflammatory substances that all get produced by the immunoglobulin, the, beta, you know, the antibodies. And so these are the internal source of inflammation that my previous slide was referring to. So with, with an upregulation of Th2, you not only get fewer natural killer cells, you get more inflammation in the body. 
Okay, so um, allergenicity of uh, reactions to foods can be something that causes um, a lot of this inflammation in the body. So something else we want to pay attention to in diet could be um, taking down the intake of highly allergenic foods and possibly lowering them this effect, this activity of antibodies in the gut. So number one thing we can tell people to do to help their reduce their risk of cancer is to control blood glucose, um, control um, other sources of inflammation like improperly heated fats, pay attention to food allergenicity issues. If they have anything autoimmune, any history of autoimmunity, I would definitely encourage staying off of the um, you know, wheat, uh, gluten, cow's milk, maybe soy, maybe eggs. But, um, and then we think about other things like substances in and on food. These are definitely powerful impacts. Pesticides. The latest big headline is glyphosate, which is a pesticide that's used on GMO crops. And um, so I, I didn't want to go into a lot of the pesticides and a lot of the organic on tonight's webinar because I covered that in my webinar on detox. So if you have interest in reviewing those slides, it is the, the my webinar on detox that goes through all the pesticides that are on foods, what they do. And it's not just that um, they're always directly uh, carcinogenic. It can be that there are pesticides that cause us to be insulin resistant, as, as I reviewed in that um, webinar, and also pesticides that um, can affect our ability to control our weight, not only from insulin resistance, which is also going to raise blood sugar, but that um, disrupt the thyroid hormones in the body. So they can be thyroid hormone disruptive. And then there are uh, pesticides and uh, metals that are directly known to be carcinogenic. So it goes without saying that one of the things that we can do to help reduce our risk of cancer is to reduce our intake of pesticide residues and the way to do that is with organic foods. So that's laid out in detail in my webinar on detox. But there are other issues with food that I think people need to be reminded of. Most people are aware now that plastics contain phthalates which are substances that are endocrine disruptive. They have estrogenic effects and um, I knew that plastic wrap and plastic dishes were a big issue when I knew that the federal government was putting out warnings saying do not heat foods in plastic in a microwave. Uh, so I knew that must be a very big deal because by the time they come out and make a warning, the evidence has to be so strong for that factor that it's not even funny. So, and it's not just BPA in plastics, there's another chemical called DEHA, which is another endocrine disruptor. So, if I'm doing class on cancer prevention, one of the things that I make sure I mention is do not use plastic containers on foods, if at all possible. And don't use plastic wrap, and most certainly do not heat foods in plastic in the microwave. Um, if you use a little plastic wrap on top of a dish, that's less risky than actually having the plastic wrap wrapped up all around the food and touching it. Okay, so interesting. I got these. Um, there are some studies that are being reported on. There's an organization called the American Institute for Cancer Research, AICR, and these were taken directly off of some information on their um, a study they have going on called CUP, C-U-P, I forget now what it stands for, but they're looking at everything that can increase risks of all different kinds of cancer. So um, you can click on kidney cancer, lung cancer, all different types. And I, I um, highlighted three or four here to make the point. When you look at things that increase stomach cancer risk, for example, these are I only listed things that were very strong evidence for. Uh, here again, 
one of the um, big things that will increase risk of stomach cancer is increased body fatness. That's how they, they word this now. They don't say being overweight or obese. They say having too much body fat because obviously you can, you can be not terribly overweight and still have way more body fat than you should because you don't have enough muscle and you have too much fat. But the more overweight we are, the more the risk, and that holds true with stomach cancer. One of the things that a lot of people don't think about is salt intake. Um, you know, we don't believe in very, very low sodium diets. Um, we think we need to go too low. Uh, in fact, that might be a good topic for an upcoming webinar. Libby, help me remember that. Uh, salt, pros and cons. Um, but one of the things that they know is that there's pretty high rates of stomach cancer in Asian countries. And one of the things that they eat a lot of are salted, um, Salt foods that are preserved with salt, like salted and dried fish especially. Uh, here in this country, it might be things like pickles that are preserved with a lot of salt. So we don't want to over intake salt. Um, you know, all the real high sodium foods are things like canned soups, um, prepackaged, you know, pre-prepared meals like um, a lot of no, I'm not going to name brand names, but you know, cheap like frozen meals. They they have a ton of salt in them. Canned um, canned spaghetti and things like that. Very high in sodium, and of course, bacon. So um, you know, watch the salt intake. It it does increase some risks. And then of course, processed meats, other processed meats that are pretty high in sodium, like hot dogs and bologna and ham. So. Just, you know, not that I say never eat it, but it shouldn't be um, front and center in your diet. It should be sparing, eaten sparingly. So that's stomach cancer. Uh, things that increase risk of the next one, Libby, um, bladder cancer. You'll notice not much here about diet. Smoking is one of the biggest things that influences bladder cancer. Um, you know, I've seen headlines here and there back in, uh, you know, years past especially that possibly artificial sweeteners increase risk of bladder cancer, but it's not strong evidence. It's maybe a link, a slight increased risk. The big things that increase bladder cancer risk are smoking and actually arsenic in drinking water. Very very, very strong evidence on that. So if we want to pick things to be proactive on, we would be proactive on having, um, having our water tested and finding out if we need to get water purifiers, etc. cetera. Uh, they've looked all ways up and down at fruit and vegetable intake. And um, the only thing with uh, diet and bladder cancer is that there was some slight risk reduction with um, increased intake of green leafy vegetables. But overall, for fruits and vegetables, there's really been no consistent findings when it comes to bladder cancer anyway. Um, liver cancer, the um, again, the strong evidence of what increases risk um, was over intake of alcohol, too much body fat, and something I've talked about before called aflatoxin, which is the toxin in uh, black mold. And we can reduce our risk with diet. We can reduce our intake of aflatoxin. The foods that um, are known to have the most aflatoxin are foods that tend to sit around in storerooms and grow black mold. Peanuts, whole grains. So. Um, these are one of the reasons why we're for watching our intake of too many peanuts, um, making sure they're real nice and fresh, and same with whole grains. Don't overdo it and make sure they're super fresh. Um, again, here for liver cancer, looking at anything that might lower risk, they listed out all these things, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, green tea, low glycemic index, um, vitamin D. Um, they said that the studies were not conclusive on whether any of these things impact um, one developing liver cancer. Uh, I would think that 
evidence would be somewhat stronger, at least on in high intake of glycemic index food, low glycemic index or high glycemic index because of how much that contributes to body fatness and how much it contributes, contributes to fatty liver. But anyway, for now, the evidence isn't in. Maybe it will come in as they continue to look at it. So just some interesting factors when you're looking at um, some of the information. What we do know, as I said, is that people with diabetes and people that with elevated blood sugars have increased risk for cancer. And we know that one of the big factors that influences that is increased intake of carbs. And I've, I've talked about this slide at length before, so I won't um, belabor it, but that's the point. Um, take in a lot of those refined sweeteners, especially corn sweeteners. You increase your risk of diabetes, and that in, in turn increases your, in, your risk of cancer. So number one thing to, to prevent cancer when it comes to diet is to follow these edicts of the anti-inflammatory diet that I've discussed at length in, in numerous of my webinars. Do not uh, take in the highly processed foods containing sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and white flour. I think we just take it for granted that, you know, I ate another hamburger bun. <laughs> Every time you eat one of those, you're um, eating a highly processed high glycemic food that causes um, post-meal uh, very elevated levels of inflammatory substances and you're affecting cancer risk. What we should be doing is taking those foods out of the diet and replacing them with the foods listed in the first bullet point, the high fiber, low glycemic carbs, vegetables in particular, especially non-starchy vegetables, our fruits, when we have a grain, it should be very high fiber, whole grain form. Legumes are excellent and um, taking in nuts and seeds because not only do are they low glycemic, they actually in and of themselves help lower that postprandial dysmetabolism just all on their own. And then eating a little bit of protein um, at meals helps low glycemic um, response. So once you, when you, I call it anchoring a meal with protein, when you eat a um, high protein food with your other foods, it slows down the release of blood sugars into the bloodstream and helps keep that post meal inflammation down. And eating salad, eating leafy greens, uh, vinegar in and of itself had a positive impact. So these are things that people can be doing every meal and if they would make sure to be consistent about it, uh, this would be one of the strongest things that people could do to lower cancer risk. Now, I'm not going to talk at length about each one of these. I wanted you to have these slides for your references. Eating a lot of plant foods is so important. I mean, these are the anti-inflammatory foods that now they're looking into research, they're looking at, you know, compounds and all of the different plant foods and um, what they do to influence cancer risk. So, um, you know, apples, for example, contain uh, those three chemical compounds there, procyanidins, catechins, triterpenoids, and those are, have all been found to um, help lower risk for skin lung, breast, and colon cancer. Um, apples are lumped into the next group with tea, grapefruit, onions, arugula. Those are some foods that contain quercetin, camphorol, I'm not sure of the pronunciation on the myrocetin, myrocetin and uh, flavanols, which decrease ascorbate-dependent free radical production. So, and they inhibit tumor, tumor agenesis. So, um, you know, I don't want to belabor every one of these, but I want you to see when you take in a ton of plant foods, they all have different activities. For example, look at the next one, beans, legumes, whole grains, bean sprouts, alfalfa, alfalfa sprouts, they are high in saponins, oleanic acid, hetagenin, hetagenin, 
And these substances neutralize enzymes in the intestines that may cause cancer. And they also boost saponins, boost immunity. You know, just look at simple citrus fruits and bell peppers as good sources of vitamin C that protect against free radicals. Um, the next foods listed, um, anything that's high in anthocyanins, bolsters antioxidant defenses, and in particular, especially against UV light. This is interesting. There's been quite a number of studies on berries of different types, especially raspberries, that they could be protective against skin cancer. And these foods, the anthocyanins, also have antimicrobial action. Well, why is that important? Remember I said that um, you know, viruses and even damage from bacteria, I didn't mention it, but damage from bacteria can, um, you know, like Helicobacter pylori can increase stomach cancer risk. So antimicrobial action um, naturally in the foods is good. So I've got tons and tons of these slides for you to look through. The, the big things that I would highlight are that broccoli and broccoli sprouts Cabbage family cruciferous vegetables contain a number of compounds, uh, sulforaphanes, thiols, indols, that um, have a ton of anti-cancer activity. So um, the substances in broccoli sprouts induce our detox enzymes in the liver, and in particular are effective against aspergillus uh, mold issues. Um, the cruciferous vegetables also downregulate um, estrogen, over um, impact of estrogens in the body. Uh, flax seeds um, that are one of the best sources of lignans that help uh, against uh, breast cancer activity or breast cancer risk in particular because the, these lignans attach to our estrogen receptors and block um, biological estrogen and um, environmental estrogens I should have listed too from exerting activity on the body. Um, estrogens are cause cell proliferation so that you don't want excess estrogen um, obviously for that increases all types of cancer not just breast cancer risks. So there's a ton of helpful substances in all our fruits and vegetables. Carrots um, inhibit cancer cell proliferation. Beta carotene increases activity of killer cells. It's um, actually also um, photoprotective, so uh, protective against UV light. And it's, it's an antioxidant. It reduces free radicals, although if you take too much of just beta carotene, somehow that may be pro-oxidant. So, Everything, there's got to be some balance. And as we move on with the list, there's just more good information. Uh, I mean, it's just a, a lot of good motivation to take in as many different types of um, plant foods as we possibly can. Grapes, berries, tomatoes, even a little bit of wine, but not excess. Um, containing ellagic acid, ferulic acid, which, OK. This is one of the activities that I like to talk about with foods. It's not all just about antioxidants. There are substances such as ellagic acid, which actually blocks uh, enzymes that inhibit P53, which is a, um, a primary tumor suppressor gene in the body. So you want your P53 to be turned on and active. Well, there are enzymes that will block P53 from working, and um, these foods block the production of those enzymes. So they keep your tumor suppressor gene um, turned on and working. And you know, people know things like green tea for all sorts of benefits, but um, watermelon, prunes and plums, eggplant, cantaloupe, apples, all kinds of foods can, are rich in these types of polyphenols that um, help neutralize free radicals to help prevent DNA, you know, damage to our DNA, which can initiate and promote cancer. Um, and then onions, garlic, leeks, shallots, can, uh, I, I love these foods. There's real strong evidence for allium and allicin as being um, compounds that decrease tumor cell growth. And they inhibit kinases. Kinases are some of the things that can turn off um, 
P53. Um, I sort of jumbled the slide, I apologize, but um, inulin, Jerusalem artichokes, and then onions, garlic, and leek are also sources, these are all foods that are source of prebiotics, um, which keep our beneficial flora healthy in our gut and producing butyrate. They know that butyrate in particular uh, lowers colon cancer risk. So um, keeping your gut healthy, keeping your uh, beneficial flora alive and well in there is cancer protective. You know, we're, we're so focused on fruits and vegetables and they're fantastic, but I just had to point out these were um, foods uh, and compounds and other animal protein foods that uh, came out of one of my favorite books that I use a lot as a dietitian, Nutrition and Diagnosis Related Care. And there's a whole section on cancer, and they have all these compounds that I'm all outlined in there. And that's where I've got, uh, that was my resource for these facts on fruits and vegetables. Well, did you know that beef, lamb, and dairy products that contain fat, so cheeses and yogurt, contain conjugated linoleic acid? And that not only supports healthy immune function uh, and has some anti tumor properties, um, we know those of us, a lot of people in integrative medicine are very well aware of conjugated linoleic acid as something that helps um, body composition, helps us uh, maintain muscle, so um, helps us in that fight against obesity and becoming overweight. So, um, you know, fruits and vegetables, great, but there are other foods that are needed to keep a well-rounded intake. Um, and looking down below, things like Brazil nuts and different types of lean meats like chicken and even lean pork, tuna, salmon, seafood, asparagus, these are all foods that contain um, either selenium or like asparagus contains glutathione um, or they contain both and we need glutathione uh, and selenium to support DNA methylation to regulate cytokine production and also, you know, glutathione is one of the most important detoxifying compounds in the body and by helping us eliminate toxins, we protect, protect, help protect against free radical damage. So the only thing I want to say is there are some studies out there that say that red meat raises cancer risk and, but it has to be quite uh, quite a bit of red meat. So it's anything over 18 ounces per week. That's a lot, but um, you know, you would, it depends on how, you know, you sit down and eat one huge steak or you eat maybe a four ounce serving four or five times a week. That's a good bit of red meat. So I do like to make people aware of this that we probably should watch our red meat intake and that's the reason why in our metabolic code um, diet, our menus and recipes, we try not to put red meat in more than once, uh, one or two times a week. And they're, you know, three to four ounce servings or so. So we stay well under that 18 ounce per week. The other big thing that I think people need to be made well aware of um, is the fact of heterocyclic amines. These are one of the compounds um, from in foods that are known to be linked with can increased cancer risk. And they form in meat when we cook it. So um, when, it, when meat is cooked at high temperatures, when it's charred on a grill, when it's cooked well done, you form heterocyclic amines and those raise cancer risk dramatically. So this is a little more information on the red meat. Um, each serving of red meat increased risk of death in general, not just from cancer, uh, but processed meats um, raised um, health risk by 20% for each serving. So then when you substitute fish, poultry, beans, nuts, you know, so uh, poultry and beans, you lowered risk when you substitute those out. So that's the way our metabolic code diet menus are, are made. There's also some um, studies that suggest that red meat 
um, increased red meat consumption can raise a person's risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, let's go on to the next slide and I've got some, there's some possible explanation as to why that might be. Um, oh, this is getting back to the heterocyclic gametes. This is just the references so you have them um, that's showing that well done meat in, increases cancer risk and I think people need to really be made aware of that. What, but here's what's interesting. The, you can lower that risk by just not cooking the meat at a very high heat. Keeping your heats 350 and under, that's a real safe um, range. That helps prevent the formation of the heterocyclic amines. The other thing you can do, you know, people are so anti-microwave. Um, there's not a ton of evidence about microwaves uh, health effects. Um, but if you actually microwave your meat for just a, uh, you know, 30 to 60 seconds before you cook it, actually the heterocyclic amines come out of the meat into the liquid and you can pour that off and that's a way to get um, to lower the heterocyclic amine in your meat. Another way is to keep the meat real moist and marinate it actually in spices helps. So they've actually listed a few of the spices that help. So it's um, marinating and um, having spices in there helps lower the risk from this. But this is the um, correlation with red meat and the intake of heme iron and how it might be linked to its somewhat increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Um, it raises serum ferritin levels fairly high, so it has to do with high um, hemoglobin and high blood counts and um, probably from oxidative stress that comes from that, that it increases um, risk for insulin resistance. So uh, one of the things I, I do tell people, you know, um, if you eat more animal protein, a lot of animal proteins are higher in iron, so it can be like dark meats and poultry. Um, one of the ways to help lower your risk from you know, taking in a little more iron is to give blood. So just you know, become a regular blood donor. And these are more um, references there for you. Don't think it's all about meat either. Um, a lot of cereals are fortified with iron, and that's another big iron source. Um, when it comes to diabetes risk, again, the biggest risk is seen with processed meats, not just red meat, but processed. Um, and they think it's due to advanced glycation and uh, lipid oxidation and products from that are that get produced at higher rates from those processed meats. Okay, we'll move on here. You know, um, there's a strong trend towards eating more and more plant foods, and I love it. Um, there's more and more pr promotion of vegetarian diet and, and vegan diet, too. And the one warning that um, I do give is that vegetarian diets are very high-carb diets. And so you have to be careful if you eat vegetarian that you eat a, as low of glycemic a vegetarian diet as you can. Um, because when you have over intake of car carbohydrates, and in particular, you know, if it's vegetarians that eat a lot of fruit or end up eating more sugar than they should, you're going to be at increased risk for diabetes and heart disease. Um, so this is uh, Frank, who a very renowned nutrition researcher out of Harvard that says, don't think that just because you choose to eat vegetarian, you get a, you get a big pass for great health. There is one little warning. If you're going to eat vegetarian, you do need to control your calories, and they need to be glycemic controlled. And then the following slide, I think, is the study that showed when they did a low-carb vegan diet, there was more weight loss, better blood sugar control, and um, lowered coronary heart disease risk. However, um, doing a vegan diet that way is pretty hard to do. The dropout rates were, were high. Um, 
And then these are just some of my slides where, um, you know, I just don't, I like people to realize that there are studies out there that do not show necessarily a tremendous um, risk in cancer from eating vegetarian or vegan. Um, they don't show real, real strong risk reduction, not like you would think. You would think taking in all those plant foods would lower risk, and it should. But I think what could be making it not as protective for some people is the high glycemic aspect of it. That's my theory. So, um, you know, some studies show modest cancer protection, but not every study is real strong on it, and I think that could be why. You've got to watch the glycemic uh, load part of it. Okay. All right, let's go on. Um, allergenicity. I, I alluded to that earlier. I'd like to mention it again. Um, for cancer, if it's a person, especially that's um, dealing with autoimmunity, I think that it's super important that they do an elimination, low allergen diet, and they control that antibody immune reactivity to allergens and foods. I, I think that that's an important part of it. So I just uh, like to reemphasize that I think that's something that should be considered for cancer risk reduction because it's such a source of internal inflammation. So when you look at what we, we have um, available to you in this lifestyle guidance portal as practitioners, some of you are probably already subscribers, some of you may not be. We have built all of this into a diet that you can deliver to your patients. So if they say, hey, how do I prevent cancer? You can say, well, you know, I actually have a really great diet that has pretty much addressed almost every component that will influence a person's cancer risk from their glycemic load, um, you know, blood sugar regulating, weight control, to anti-inflammatory, like including fish, um, and other sources of omega-3s, lots of vegetables, and takes out, um, tells people how to discover whether they're having reactivity to allergens in foods or not. Um, that's the, you know, not, not everybody, uh, it's not a factor for everybody, but I think people should find out, is my body having an immune response to allergenic proteins in um, the high allergen foods. And then, of course, we really emphasize eating foods all organic as much as possible or otherwise not chemical treated. So maybe it's sustainable but not organic, but you can verify that chemicals have not been used on the food. That's an important component when it comes to cancer prevention, and that's built in on our diet. I just wanted to be fair and mention that, you know, paleo diets do recommend high intake of plant foods and have been shown to have some efficacy in um, controlling blood sugar. You know, um, they have been shown to degre decrease hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, weight, BMI. So if you look at the metabolic code diet, you'll see that it pretty much fits uh, paleo with the one exception that we do allow beans and legumes um, as a source of resistant starch because we believe that, you know, if you don't have enough resistant starch sources over time, the gut health can break down because those are the things that keep beneficial flora going. So that's the one um, caveat there. We're a little different, but otherwise we fit um, paleo in our phase one because there's no dairy and there's no um, cereal, cereal grains at all, but there are a few beans and legumes. Anyway, just in fairness, <clears throat> so that's the study itself, um, just so you have the reference. And this is just to let you know, this would be our one thing to look out for on paleo diets is to make sure you get the resistant starch, okay? Now, the final thing I want to mention when it comes to cancer diet and, pre and cancer prevention. I've discussed all the healthy diet components that I think are important. Controlling blood sugar, controlling autoimmune allergy tendencies, 
taking in plenty of plant foods. If you um, take in animal protein, cook it at low temperatures, and take those other measures to reduce heter heterocyclic animals. As much as possible, take in organic foods, um, sustainable, low chemical, and don't do things like use plastic. But we think there's way more to it than just this diet component and it comes to total metabolic support. You know, sometimes I have people that just can hardly control their blood glucose without going extremely low in carbohydrate intake and that's when other nutrition support enters the picture. Do everything you can to support blood glucose with the blood glucose support um, supplement formula. You know, if people are having trouble controlling their weight, they need full metabolic support, and that includes proper thyroid evaluation and support. Um, gut health needs looked at. You know, that's one of the big revelations of the last few years is in intestinal health. Um, when, it, when our beneficial flora are out of whack, that is one of the biggest things that causes production of internal inflammatory substances. So take a look at that. And then another issue that I, you know, this, this presentation was about diet, but we know that stress has a huge impact on cancer risk. Um, and it's because when we're under stress, our Th1 side of our immunity gets suppressed. So if people have highly stressful situations going on in their life, do everything you can to um, help them manage that stress, whether it's with adaptogenic um, herbs and other supplements that are helpful um, to, uh, you know, breathing techniques, whatever, um, whatever you can do to get them to um, understand that they've got to take measures to control that stress. You know, stress even impacts food cravings. So, you know, if a person is having food cravings, um, that's going to make it so they can't manage their weight. And again, being overweight and obese, uh, getting up into the obese category is one of the number one things that increases a person's cancer risk. So, you know, it's, my point is um, people may need more than just diet to truly manage their risks. Oh, cancer treatment support when people have, have existing cancer. All the same things apply. All the same things. Eat a lot of plant foods. Uh, eat, you know, organic. Limit intake of toxins. Do everything you can to support and help your body with, with good, healthy nutrition. Eat low sugar. Don't eat a ton of sugar. Um, not only because it's just not healthy, but also because um, one of the big things that people undergoing cancer treatment experience uh, when they're undergoing chemo is uh, the development of thrush and yeast and fungal infections. And we know that sugar is one of the, too much intake of sugar will exacerbate that. So it's especially important for um, people if they've developed problems with thrush is to watch their sugar intake. One of the big things that you know, kind of makes a lot of this go out the door for once a person has cancer is they lose their appetite. And so it's really hard for them to take in very many of all those wonderful healthy fruits and vegetables because they, they don't want to eat much. They just don't have appetite. So one of the things that we do, in, and then if you're encouraging them to eat vegetables, those are some of the lowest calorie foods there are. So what we do is we encourage them to add um, healthy fats to those vegetables. So go ahead and put some organic butter. You need those calories. Um, use coconut oil where you can. Um, put it into soups. Put it, you know, use it for stir fries. But do everything you can to increase the caloric density of what you are managing to take in. So you might have to. Uh, add a tasteless whey protein powder to soups, for example, to get them more protein. Um, if there's oral pain with eating because the mouth is, you know, can get sore from undergoing treatment or there's difficulty swallowing, you know, go ahead and take those healthy broccoli, steam it up, and, you know, make it into a, a soup. Um, I have a great broccoli soup recipe that we've been 
that we've got. Um, I could even make it available for you because I've had people get through, you know, broccoli, sulforaphanes. Those are some of the best foods to take in. Uh, I've had cancer patients that, you know, make that broccoli soup, add the tasteless whey, and it really helped them get through. It's a way to have something healthier that goes down easy. So, you know, puree foods, if they can't eat their organic chicken, um, they can put it in a blender with some chop and puree it and add it to a soup or something. But it's a way to get the more nutritious foods down. And then another big thing that can impact people undergoing cancer treatment is just a lot of nausea. And one of the things I meant to put down here and forgot to, um, one of the big things that will help nausea, believe it or not, is to drink a lot of water, to get as much water down as you can. Sometimes that's hard though, but um, staying hydrated is the point. But ginger really does help a lot of people with um, chemo-induced nausea, uh, ginger tea, ginger ale. And another big thing that will help that is to keep away from food odors. So when food is being prepared, uh, you know, like broccoli will put out quite a smell when you cook it. So just um, try to have a family member help with food um, preparation and just stay clear in another part of the house to help um, prevent the food odors from causing more nausea. So those are just, those are the most common things that we that we come into, um, that we see coming into play with people that are, have already developed cancer. But my whole point for not spending um, a little more time on actual how can foods help whenever somebody already has cancer is because there's no real strong um, evidence for diet alone um, making a, a huge difference once people have cancer. Um, and I think that it can, as long as the person, I think it can make a big difference. I've seen people complete, completely change their diet and eat healthier, and um, it seems to make a huge impact. But different cancers are different. Um, cancer is, um, cells are shifty. <laughs> They're kind of like viruses. They, they seem like they mutate, they adapt, and they become resistant to anti um, anti-cancer components in the foods. But the biggest issue is not even that so much is as it is the fact that once somebody's undergoing cancer treatment, um, their appetite is so reduced. That it's, I, I just find that it's hard for them to take in enough of these healthy foods. But um, certainly we advocate doing everything they can to eat as healthy as possible, get in as many of those uh, plant foods as possible for all those cancer-fighting properties, um, and then we deal with some of the side effects in these ways. So that's my um, one slide talk about cancer treatment support. And I can do certainly more on that later if there's any interest. But to wrap it all up, um, I just want to say thank you for attending. I hope you found the information helpful. Um, I hope um, the, the key point of controlling blood sugar <laughs> came through loud and clear. And, um, you know, I didn't get to talk about spices and the role they can play in this. So I thought, well, why don't we do that next time? So let's talk about the role of spices in health. And I think most people are aware of spices and what they can do, but I think they find it challenging. What do I add them to um, that really tastes good? So I want to give some... Um, recipes and foods and tips for using more of them. People are aware and then they end up just relying on their same old salt, pepper, a little bit of garlic powder or something. So um, that's next time. And uh, thanks for taking time out of busy schedules and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we do have one question so far entered into the chat box, but I do want to give just another couple minutes for folks to enter any others. If there are any other questions, please enter those in the chat box and let me also check to see if any hands are up. If you have okay. a, uh, let's see. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention um, 
is a really good book on diet and cancer called Anti-Cancer by David Servan Schreiber. It's a really good book. It's got a lot of good more information on all the phytochemicals and plant foods and some of the studies that are out there about um, plant foods and how they fight cancer. Um, but it, it's a really good book. Okay, so the first question is, what was the site where the information came from when you had mentioned CUP? When I had mentioned what? CUP. Um, AICR. It's American Institute for Cancer Research. And, um, oh, I've got here, I just pulled it up on my computer. It stands, the CUP stands for Continuous Update Project. Good info on there. Okay, great. And then the next question we have, what are your thoughts about using foods to increase body alkalinity versus acidity in helping with cancer? Um, interesting phenomenon. Um, when we have clients come in for um, anything come in for, one of the things we do is we test saliva, salivary pH. And um, it's interesting to me that um, many of, if not most of our cancer patients come in extremely acidic. Uh, however, there is nothing in the literature to show that an acidic pH um, in and on its own is something that makes cancer more able to grow. Um, doing baking soda therapies, um, you know, being researched, but it, it doesn't seem to be um, effective in all cancers, uh, if any. So here's what my personal theory is. I think people that, um, that are coming in that have cancer, um, they have a lot of things um, that have been affecting them. And certainly low intake of fruits and vegetables can be one of them. Um, and that does make us more acidic. Eating a lot of vegetables and some fruit um, does alkalinize the body. But I don't think it's the acidity that's making it cancer. I think it's the fact that they just haven't been taking in enough of all those anti-cancer compounds with the high fruit and vegetable intake and all those, you know, selenium, magnesium, zinc, all those important nutrients that um, that, you know, support all the different processes of the controlling blood sugar and all those things in the body. So that's my, my theory. Um, the literature, sh I mean, and here's another interesting thing. Every now and then we have clients that come in with cancer that are, are too alkaline. They're extremely alkaline. So if cancer doesn't grow in alkaline environment, um, why would a person with high alkalinity uh, of sal saliva, uh, you know, be growing cancer. So um, supposedly these are people that could be non-absorbers, so you would tend to want to look at, you know, urine pH in those people. But anyway, that that's my, I've really look, been looking at this issue, and um, we do see cancer patients, a lot of them come in, they are extremely acidic and there's saliva, but um, just um, getting them on an alkalinizing diet um, doesn't always, it very often doesn't um, make the cancer go away long term, doesn't uh, cure it, unfortunately, I wish it did. Okay, um, it looks like maybe there may be one hand up. So I am going to unmute Jay so he can ask his question. Okay.
Jay had a question. You're unmuted. We're ready when you are. Or you can type your question into the chat box. One other thing I was going to say on the, um, on the acidity is that it is often the case that I have people that come in that do have cancer that um, have been eating a good many fruits and vegetables and they're still acidic. So there can be other things that are affecting that pH. Um, and in fact, that's a phenomena I tend, we tend to see it in people come in that are vegan and vegetarian, despite the fact they're eating um, no animal proteins whatsoever, uh, they're still acidic. We're not getting Jay's audio for some reason, so I'm not sure if we'll see that question come through in the chat. I'm sorry, Jay, we're not picking up your audio, so I'm going to mute you again and move on to the next question. What effect does food have on metastasis? Well, um, there are a number of foods that um, will be like especially the cruciferous vegetables that have the um, activity on anti-tumor uh, anti-tumor activity um, directly there are foods that affect um, apoptosis um, there are foods that affect blood supply um, so anything that supports those mechanisms should have a role in slowing down progression, which met metastasis is part of progression. Uh, and that's some of the interesting information that I like in that anti-cancer book. Um, it discusses those components um, specifically. Um, so cruciferous vegetables, allergic acid, those uh, in berries, those are two of the categories of foods that I would tend to try to um, emphasize for people in helping slow down progression. Um, and then not feeding that cancer with sugar, um, but uh, anything that helps um, those Im impacts are things that, that would potentially help. Um, stop metastasis. Okay, I think another hand went up. I will unmute Adam so he can ask his question. Adam? Hey, hi, Laura. Can you hear me? Hi. I, I have some grass-fed beef. I'm still low heat. Okay, we're getting that ready. <laughs> Thanks for a great, a great lecture. Um, my question is, how you're using micronutrient testing, and how often are you getting patients on quote unquote ideal diets for them, and still picking up on micronutrient t testing uh, deficiencies? Well, uh, gee. I I, I wish I could take a guess at a, like a percentage on that. Um, I would just say this, um, micronutrient deficiency will definitely tend to be more, uh, more of an issue in people that gut health has been playing um, a role in their, in their health over the years. So if you go back and look at a person's health history and you see that, you know, well, let's say they're a they're a uh, Hashimoto's thyroid person. We know that you know the autoimmunity, the uh, the gut health is the underlying thing with that, and it, and I do see that definitely impacting people's absorption of the micronutrients. So I like I say I I, I don't have a percentage, but I would say if I look at the person's health history, and I see a history of you know what I call the gut you know in the gut milieu of problems. So if people had a history of long history of migraines, I'm gonna think gut. They had a history of arthritis, I'm thinking, you know, they this is a gut related issue. 
um, that would be people that I would tend to see more micronutrient issues in. Um, when it comes to um, cancer, you know, specifically, I do try to look at the micronutrients that support the, you know, glutathione and the superoxide dismutase production. So your selenium, your manganese, um, you know, zinc. So I, I, we do, um, we do look at those. Uh, one of I, I, you know, in my pr presentations, um, we speak mostly about. I, I only talk mostly about diet, but um, we're real big um, advocates for a product called Avamar. Um, we, even though it's fermented wheat germ, which has tended to keep some people away from it because of the fact that it's made from wheat, but it's fermented, and um, it's the fermentation byproducts that are used in the supplement. So there's not a lot of that, the actual wheat um, germ itself. It's as it's been changed by the fermentation process. And one of the things that Avamar does is it works on the kinases. So um, it's got some real strong study on it for showing um, better outcomes with use of Avamar in treatment as opposed to um, just conventional treatment alone. And I think um, they zeroed in on kinase in inhibition as one of the big um, effects of that product. Great. Thanks again for an awesome lecture. Sure. Let me take just one more quick scan and make sure that was the last of the questions. And it looks to be that that will wrap it up for tonight. So thank you, Laura, so much. And everyone who was able to attend, please do visit metaboliccode.com for more information on our metabolic code system and how you can participate in a free trial if you're not already subscribing. Email any questions to me at info at metaboliccode.com. And again, I will post the recording of tonight's session to our blog also on metaboliccode.com. Thanks again and have a great night. Thanks. Good night.